Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me talk about a couple of things. Um, there was a fight that happened yesterday that really needs to be watched. It was Saki Obika against Marco Antonio Parabin. Now this fight actually is major for a host of reasons. Let's talk about some of the things you should consider. Right now, Bika won this fight. Bika is now one of the super middleweight champions. But understand there are other winners. As bright as Joe Calzaghi's legacy is, and keep in mind, Calzaghi has been retired for years. It's just got brighter. Because when you beat a young lion, and that young lion goes on to win a championship, then when people talk about your resume, they're going to say, he beat future champion blank. Right? Well, Joe Calzaghi beat Saki Obika years ago, using a lot of hand speed and a lot of angles. Right? As people re-examine Calzaghi's record, they're going to have to recognize that he actually did beat some meaningful fighters. The knock on Calzaghi for years was that his resume was a little bit thin. But the fact that Calzaghi beat Bernard Hopkins, who then subsequently went on to win at different times, the light heavyweight championship, that's after losing to Joe Calzaghi. And the fact that Calzaghi beat Bika to go, of course, with Calzaghi beating Mikel Kessler, who again, after that fight, was able to regain his championship and is a big part of Carl Frotch's resume, in my opinion, will help the Joe Calzaghi legacy. Let's also talk about Andre Ward. This is getting absurd. Talk about domination of a division. You mean to tell me that one guy has beaten Kessler, Frotch, and now new champion Saki Obika? Think about how ridiculous Ward's legacy is. While he was in the Super 6 tournament, he took a fight outside of the tournament. Who did he fight? Saki Obika, who just won the belt yesterday. Think about it. So Andre Ward at this point, really, is a Hall of Famer. I know it sounds ridiculous to say that of a guy in his 20s, but if you believe Carl Frotch is a possible Hall of Famer, how about the guy who beat Carl Frotch? A loss of which Carl Frotch hasn't avenged. Understand when you look at a guy and his record, it's not necessarily the length of his career, it's who he's beaten. And right now, Andre Ward, just in the last few fights, has beaten three guys who hold a share of the super middleweight title, as well as one former light heavyweight champion. Absurd. Right? Let me also point out, too, that Mikel Kessler star has just gotten brighter. I think Mikel Kessler is a Hall of Famer as it is, right? If you look through Kessler's resume, you're going to see victories over real opponents. Guys like, not just Carl Froch, but Anthony Mundine. Way back in the day, Kessler, among his other victories, also has a victory over Saki Obika. So Saki Obika's win actually is major. Let's talk about something else, too, just for fight fans. This is really a boxing informational type video. You know, we focus on the older guys who have been great trainers in the sport. Emmanuel Stewart clearly was a great trainer, right? Not just the Kronk Gym, but also multiple heavyweight champions, um, Lennox Lewis, as well as Vladimir Klitschko, and countless others, right? Nacho Beristain is a legendary trainer. Freddie Roach is a legendary trainer. Floyd Mayweather Sr. is a legendary trainer. In my opinion, Roger Mayweather is a great trainer and 
is underrated, one man's opinion. Well, there's a new group of trainers. Don't just follow the fighters. Follow the trainers, because as you look at championship boxers, as you look in their corners, sometimes you're going to notice familiar faces, right? I'm a big fan of Joel Diaz, right? The trainer for Timothy Bradley. I think he's a young guy. By young, I mean younger than, let's say, Nacho Beristain and Emmanuel Stewart, right? He's a young guy, but he's getting things done with multiple fighters. His brother was the fighter who just gave Amir Khan all he could handle in the UK, right? Well, another trainer you need to know is the guy who was in Saki Obika's corner last night, Kevin Cunningham, right? The boxing heart, hardcore know that Cunningham is the trainer for Devin Alexander, who quite frankly is looking dominant these days at 147 pounds, right? Well, Cunningham also now has another champion in Saki Obika. And I thought Cunningham did a tremendous job because they were in against an underrated, and he's very underrated, today he's underrated, opponent in Marco Antonio Parabet. And let me just say, how close was this fight? At the start of the 12th round, Kevin Cunningham looks at his fighter, Saki Obika, and he says, it's too close. Right? Cunningham is telling his fighter, he needs to win the 12th round to take the fight. Now, don't be distracted by the judges' scorecards. By the way, this was not a unanimous decision. It was a majority decision. One judge had it 114-114. I'm here to tell you, this fight could have gone either way. Right? Saki Obika is your prototypical mid-range hooker. But in my opinion, he's a physical freak. He's very strong for the weight class. He takes a big punch. He's one of boxing's harder punchers, right? He's just physically an outlier athlete. I don't believe he's as skilled, one man's opinion, as his opponent was Marco Antonio Parabin. Now let's talk about Parabin because it really deserves to be noted. You know, often I'll make a video and someone will then start in the comment section talking about you know a Mexican style of fighting right the idea is that every athlete from Mexico every boxer from Mexico um, comes in is willing to take a lot of punches is willing to throw a lot of punches emphasizes offense two-handed offense right dispenses with the jab, battles from the trenches, has the heart of a warrior, fights like Antonio Margarito or Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. Right? That's the that's the stereotype that shows up on occasion in the comment section to my videos. I've been trying to tell people for a long time now that these racial stereotypes are absurd. Because if you look at Mexico, if you look at Mexican boxing history, you're going to see fighters like Salvador Sanchez. In fact, before him, Sugar Ramos, if you want to go way back. But you're going to see fighters who stick and move, right? Fighters who really fight, you know, um, how do you put it, behind a jab with a lot of movement. A style very different than Antonio Margarito's style, right? Well, right now, two of Mexico's best fighters are among boxing's most slick fighters, right? Movement, a jab, head movement, head on a swivel, rolls with punches, able to fight outside and inside. People here know that I like... Miguel Vasquez, the lightweight champion, very slick. He's bringing the fast break back to boxing. Let me just say, Marco Antonio Parabin is also bringing the fast break back to boxing. This guy is slick. This guy was in with a heavy mid-range hooker and is able to literally just move, roll with punches. This guy has a great jab. 
This guy's your prototypical boxer puncher. He hits hard. Bika took a lot of shots because Bika has a great chin. But in the 12th round, you saw how hard Paraben hits because Bika, quite frankly, looks like he's about to go. Right? Paraben, who has only lost once, and that's in this fight, and let me tell you, again, in my opinion, this is a close loss that could have gone either way. Right? Paraben is a guy who you need to watch. He's tall. He's 6'2". You need to watch him not just at 168 pounds. You need to watch this guy at 175 pounds. I don't care who he fights in either weight class. He's a formidable opponent, right? If you, if the casinos are as crazy as I think they are, and if you hear that Paraben is matched against anyone at 168 and 175, and if Paraben is a 10 to 1 underdog or the kind of underdog that welterweight champion Paulie Malinaji was last night, then in my opinion, you need to run to the casino and put a bet down. This guy easily could be the super middleweight champion. This guy would give anyone at 168 or 175, and yes, that includes the guys who I view highly. Guys like James DeGale. Guys like Andre Ward. People, longtime viewers know that I think the world of those guys. Right? I think Paraben would give those guys a hard time. I'm not saying he beats those guys. But let's just say Paraben is championship level. Stylistically, let me make another point. Paulie Malinaji didn't move as well as I wanted him to against Adrian Broner. That fight was there for him to win. We know that because one judge had him winning the fight. Right? Let me say that it's interesting. But the fight that Marco Antonio Paraben fights against Sakio Bika is exactly the fight that Pauli Malinaji should have fought against Adrian Broner. Let me point out that Paraben hits much harder than Malinaji. Right? That might be the reason why Saki Obik is not exactly enthusiastic to track down Paraben, right? Granted, Paraben has some uh, abilities that Pauli Malinaji does not have. But if Malinaji just moved a little bit more, and if that ring was just a little bit better, right? The ring at the Barclay Center was so bad that Saki Obika falls down in the Paraben fight, right? You could tell. That ring was what's called a soft ring. Jim Gray talks about it after the Malinaji Broner fight. If that ring was a faster ring that allowed a mover to move a little bit without slipping and sliding, if that ring was level instead of not being level, and if Malinaji wasn't 32, if he was just a little bit younger with a little bit more spring in his legs, I believe Broner would have been there for the taking. Okay? Let's talk about another fight. Jonathan Banks against Seth Mitchell. I thought Banks was going to win this fight. I'll tell you what, during the fight I thought Banks was going to win this fight. I don't know what happened. I'm going to turn this over to the subscribers here. I don't know what happened the second half of the fight. It looked curious. At one point they actually interviewed Vladimir Klitschko, Jonathan Banks' friend who's there in Brooklyn to support his guy, right? They actually interview him. And Vladimir Klitschko was puzzled as to how Banks let Seth Mitchell off the hook. Now, I know reports are going to be that Mitchell avenged Banks. I remain a Seth Mitchell skeptic. My concerns weren't addressed. I thought Mitchell looked like he was about to go early in that fight, right? It seemed to me that the second half of the fight, maybe Banks pulled a muscle, maybe he was injured, but it seemed to me like he just wasn't throwing punches. It seemed to me he was just doing rounds without making the effort. Now, it was a 12-round fight, and different guys paced themselves differently, right? Especially heavyweights. It's possible that Jonathan Banks thought that Seth Mitchell, a great athlete, was going to fade late in that fight. And it's true, Seth Mitchell doesn't have a lot of experience going into the later rounds. 
But I thought Banks left that fight on the table. I thought Banks could have closed the show early in that fight. I thought the knockdown of Banks was ridiculous. That's an obvious rabbit punch. Shouldn't have been called. I thought when Banks roughed up Mitchell, I thought Mitchell had no answers. Right? So it's curious to me why Banks didn't up the volume. Right? Uh, I'll concede. I thought Banks was going to win that fight. He did not. I had to eat crow there. To sum up, Saki Obika now has a share of the belt at 168 pounds. The superstars who beat him in the past, Lucy and Boutte, for example, just got their resumes upgraded. I believe it matters most for Joe Calzaghe simply because Calzaghe retired unbeaten. Carl Froch keeps calling out Calzaghe. There seems to be an active discussion in some boxing circles over who was the better super middleweight. Right? Let's keep in mind Calzaghe beat a younger, then unbeaten Mikel Kessler. Calzaghe also has beaten Saki Obika. Calzaghe was an underdog against Jeff Lacey. Calzaghe did beat Chris Eubank. I don't want to go too deep into the Joe Calzaghe story, but just keep in mind Calzaghe remains, right, other than Chad Dawson. The last man to beat Bernard Hopkins. Let me hear from you. Keep an eye on Marco Antonio Parabin. Don't go by wins and losses. Go by ability. This guy is slick. He's long. He knows how to fight long. He can also fight inside. He's excellent defensively. Keep in mind, the guy, even when he's high volume and doesn't have a hand up, the guy is rolling with punches. Also, they pointed out during the telecast that Parabin went through a round in an earlier fight where he's recorded as having thrown 140 punches, the most ever recorded by a fighter in a round in the division, right, according to Showtime. So think about that as you watch him. I think Parabon is a guy who could be one of these bigger names in the very near future. Let me hear from you. Thanks for watching.